let's do another question here. So I have a thin uniform metal bar, two meters long and weigh 90 newtons. It's hanging vertically from the ceiling by frictionless pivot. Suddenly it struck 1.5 meters below the ceiling by a small three kilogram ball initially traveling horizontally at 10 meters per second. The ball rebounds in the opposite direction with a speed of six meters per second. Okay, so you see I've listed this kind of out. So here we have it freely pivoted. So that's gonna be our axis of rotation. Um, the ball comes in at 1.5 meters away, hits it and bounces back. So we come in with a positive velocity, leave with a negative velocity. Um, I did take that 90 Newtons and divide it by 9.8 to get the mass in kilograms for that bar. Okay, so let's see what they want us to find. Find the angular speed of the bar just after the collision. And then B, during the collision, why is angular momentum conserved, but not linear momentum? Okay, so first thing we do have to do is figure out is, is angular momentum conserved so that I can solve the problem? And so if I think about some of these forces, so I got gravity here, I got gravity here, and I probably have some forces acting at that pivot point. Um, likely there's a force, so if, as this pushes on this, it's trying to move this entire bar that direction. So this is probably applying a force in that direction and a force up. Those would probably be those two components. Um, the reason I can say momentum, angular momentum is conserved is because these two forces, when we get them in the hitting portion of this, both of those are acting parallel to the radius, not perpendicular. So they're not producing any torque. So gravity doesn't produce any torque about this axis of rotation. And these two forces being at the axis rotation don't produce any torque either. And so because there is no net torque, external net torque I should say, angular momentum is conserved. The reason linear momentum is not conserved is because there is a net force acting in that horizontal direction. Um, so then we'd have to include whatever this structure is as part of our momentum problem if we wanted to do linear momentum conservation. All right, so let's kind of set that up. So angular momentum conservation, so I got, um, oops, my bad. Can't jump right into MRV, can we? So I have I1 omega one plus I2 omega two equals I1 prime omega one prime plus I2 prime omega two prime. Now a couple things to note here, um, the bar and the ball, they don't change. So their I values are gonna be the same before and afterwards. So I'm gonna get rid of those primes. Um, the ball is a point mass. So to figure out the moment of inertia of a point mass, um, for a point mass, it's gonna be mR squared. And so therefore the angular momentum I times omega is gonna be mR squared. And then because it's moving linearly, we're gonna make a substitution of V over R in for omega, and we're left with MERV for that moment of inertia for a point mass. Now the I value for this bar, okay, so my I value is the integral of lambda x squared dx, where lambda, since this is a uniform bar, is a uniform density times a uniform cross-sectional area of whatever those two values are for this bar. Um, I can go ahead and take that integral from zero to L um, because it's about the end point. So that's where that zero and it goes to this length L, that's where that L comes in. So I go ahead and integrate that. And so we end up with one third density cross-sectional area from, of X cubed evaluated from zero to L. This then becomes my one third density cross-sectional area L cubed. Um, instead of writing L cubed, I'm gonna write L times L squared. That's because then I can do this density times cross-sectional area times length. Cross-sectional area times length gives me volume. Volume times density gives me mass. And we're always looking for a pal here so we can substitute in mass. And so there's my moment of inertia for this bar about the end. Now we can start to actually put these, this information in here. So originally the bar is not moving but the ball is. So I have M1, R1, V1 equals M1, R1, V1 prime plus I2, which I just kind of set up here, 
times omega two prime. And we're really trying to solve for that omega two prime. So let's move this over. So now I have M1 R1 times V1 minus V1 prime, all divided by my I2, which we can make that substitution now. It's one third M2 L squared will give me my final omega prime. Um, I, Good point here to note is we do need to make sure we have that negative sign on that six, otherwise this is not going to work out for us. So plugging in those numbers, uh, so I have three times 1.5 times 10 minus a negative six, all divided by one third times that 90 divided by 9.8 times L, which was two squared, will give me the omega prime here. Putting that into my calculator, I end up with 5.88 radians per second is how fast that bar rotates off initially. There you go.